Tonight, if, if we can, we're going to look at Revelations chapter 12, verse 11 and 12. And this is the main reason I'm going to share my testimony. I've never been real comfortable about it because I, I'm ashamed of the things that I did while I was a sinner. I'm certainly ashamed of the fact that I was a member of a gang from 8 to almost 25 years of age. I'm ashamed of the fact that I spent six years of my life incarcerated, that I was a drug addict and an alcoholic, that my personal lifestyle caused two of my loved ones to be killed because of the things that I did. There's nothing to be proud of about that. But I share my testimony to let you know there's power in your testimony. There's power in my testimony. And the Bible said in Revelations chapter 11, or chapter 12, verse 11, this is when the Antichrist is at his full power and all hell is broke loose on the planet Earth. It's far worse than anything we've ever seen in the history of this planet. And these are the word, this is the word of God concerning this time. How can people survive in a time far worse than anything we've ever experienced to this point where the Antichrist spirit is working as we've never seen it work in our lifetimes and we never will in our lifetimes, not here because we're going to be gone. And I'm talking about how do you survive in a world like that? where the word of God says that they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. You can overcome the dragon himself. You can overcome the devil at his greatest height of power during the great tribulation period with the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. Your testimony... Reminding yourself where God bought you from to where you are today will remind you that the God that bought you through then he will bring you through now. The God that took care of you then will take care of you now. COVID hasn't changed. That never will. And they overcame. They overcame the dragon, the Antichrist spirit. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the blood of Jesus and by the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives unto death. So we know there's power in our testimony because it is enough power in the blood of the Lamb and our testimony to overcome the devil and anything he throws our way. Somebody shout hallelujah. That's why churches like this, meeting and being on live feed like this, is so important because we're telling the world that the way we overcome COVID-19 is the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Jesus still saves, doesn't he? He still delivers, don't he? He still heals, don't he? Now, verse number 12, it says, Therefore rejoice ye, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to, to the inhabitants of the earth and on, on of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he, is, that he have but a short time. In other words, the reason why things have gotten so bad lately is the devil knows that his days are numbered. He has but a short time. So he's turning loose all the power he's got, but his power is not enough to stand up against one drop of the blood of Jesus Christ or the word of Jesus Christ. I know that to be a fact because 40 years ago in the city of Chicago, now I joined the gang and I'm ashamed of it at the age of eight. Now I'm repeating this a little bit just for a second. And the gang I joined was the Gaylords, but later they joined up with the Playboys and the PBPs and we just became the Lords. And then the Latin Kings was, was primarily, and you know, I really found it interesting that the Lords was the largest white street gang in the city of Chicago. And eventually I became the warlord of that gang. And I guess they didn't know that I was three quarters Italian because when you're Italian, you're Latin. And, and, but, I'm just, but I want to share some with you. I'm getting to that point. And so I, I joined the Lords and I said the, the other largest gang in that neighborhood was, was the Latin Kings, which was primarily made up of the Puerto Ricans. And then the Oas, which was Mexicans. And of course, the Black Panthers was the Black Panther that were black. But it had nothing to do with race. It had nothing to do with color, unless you were talking about the color green. Because the gang that controlled the turf controlled the protection money. They controlled the drug business. They controlled the prostitution. 
They controlled all of these things. So it wasn't about race. It was about money. It was about drugs. It was about control. So the point that I'm trying to make is by that time of my life, I joined the game when I was 12 and, and, and at eight. And by the time I was 12, I'd already spent three years of my life in reform school. At the age of 12, I was sent off to the worst reformatory in the whole state of Illinois. It's called Montefiore because I broke a kid's arm at school because we got in a fight. I want you to understand something. The gangs, and we all knew it. The leaders of the gangs knew it. They knew that, that we, they played the card to, get, to recruit people into the gang, but it didn't have nothing to do with race. It had to do with power and control of the neighborhood. Now, when I joined this gang at eight, and I was 12 years old, I was sent off to a reform school called Montefiore. Now, I was born in 1956. So in 1968, the laws existed to protect kids in reform school and people in prison, but the laws were not enforced as good as they are today, and thank God they're enforced much better today. They were in fact then. But most of the guards in the reform system were people who had uncles or cousins who were aldermen who could deliver a lot of votes on the election day. So they got jobs like guards and reform schools in prison. So most of the guards, they did not take attribute tests. They were not really qualified for this position. Many of them were sadistic. Now, I have greatest, highest respect and regard for law enforcement. Aren't you thankful for the men and women and that keep us safe today? Give them a hand of appreciation. And I have no beef with the police officer that arrested me and I was convicted by his testimony and ended up in reform school because I, that was the place where I belonged. But when I was in reform school, my first night there, my uncles Dominic and Joe, they warned me. They said, the first day you're there, because this was the worst reformatory in the whole state of Illinois. They said, the first day you're there, they're going to try to break you. And I'm going to be careful how I say this because there's women and children present. And my uncles told me how they were going to try to break me. They said, they're going to rape you. And they're going to rape you repeatedly until you'll do whatever they tell you to do. And if you don't want to be taken advantage of the whole time you're there, you have to stop that from happening. And they told me what to do. They said, when you go in, they're going to take your clothes and they're going to give you your, your coveralls, your orange coveralls. They're going to give you a bar of soap and a sock. I don't know if they do that anymore 40 years later. But then they gave you a bar of soap and socks. And they said, now don't put the socks on, but you put the bar of soap in the sock and tie a knot to it, and you use it for a blackjack when they come after you in the shower because they're going to come after you. First of all, they, they strip you down. Then they sprayed you down with insecticide, and then you go into the general population. When I walked in there as a 12-year-old kid, you got to remember there was men in that reformatory that were in there for murder, and crimes that they were going to have to do 25 years or longer. Many of them were lifers. And the only reason why they were in that reformatory is they were too young to be sent off to the prison. So there was men that were 16, 17 year old in there that already had murdered several people. And they didn't know what mercy was. And they knew they were never going to get out again. So they had nothing to fear. And I walked into that reformatory. I was 12 years old. And, and listen to me, beloved. I don't see color. If I do see color, I see the color red, the color of Jesus' blood. I, I don't see races. But you know reality. When you're, in, when you're in the world, we're in this world, but we're not of this world. But if you're in the world system, there's a lot of people that judge everything by the color of your skin or the lightness of your skin. This particular reformatory was 80% African-American. Now, I'm a game banger from the rival gang, and the Black Panthers run that prison so you can imagine what the situation's going to be like. I'm not being vulgar. But the first night I was in there, they tried to rape me. I bit them. I did everything in my power. And my uncles told me what I had to do to stop myself from being raped. And I did it. And they told me if I did it, 
that they were going to stomp me and they were going to beat me half to death. But from that moment on, they would respect me and they wouldn't do it no more. And so I did what they said. And for protecting, defending myself, what I had to do, some of the men I'll tell you if you want to ask me privately later. I won't say it in front of the ladies. But I did what I had to do. But let, I can only put it this way. I was as close to being raped as you could be without actually being physically raped. That's how close it got. And my punishment for attacking my rapist was I was put, now you gotta remember this is 1968. There was men in this reform school at that time, and this, and this is no knock on law enforcement, please hear me, that, that were later arrested and put away for selling pornography of films that they filmed of inmates being raped by other inmates. And so they weren't going to protect you when you went to scream and calling for help. And the more you cried and the more you screamed out, the more you became a victim and the more the rapists enjoyed it. And so my punishment for fighting back and stopping myself from being raped, I'm 12 years old, is they put me in a box that was just barely big enough for me. I couldn't even get on my hands and knees inside the box. They told me I was 12 years old, mind you. Now remember, this sounds hardcore, but there's several inmates in this facility that are never going to see the light of day again. Their life is already because they've committed several murders and were caught and convicted. They put me in this box, and it was so small that I had to kind of like curl my legs up. And now I'm just a 12-year-old kid, and I'm inside this wooden box. And they tell me that they're going to bury me and that they're going to bury me alive. You see, this was their system of breaking the unruly inmates. And defending, because of my long arrest record, they didn't just see that I was defending myself from being raped. They thought that perhaps I started the altercation, that perhaps I was the one that bought it on myself. So they stuck me inside this wooden box. I could not stand up. I slept in that box. I went to the bathroom in that box. And I slept in my own waist. Now, when you're 12 years old, and he puts you in a box, and they tell you they're going to bury you alive, you believe them. I found out later that they didn't kick me even out of the room, but they picked the box up and moved it around and gave me the feeling of I being carried somewhere. And then I was told later they threw sand up against the box and on the box. And while they did it, they told me they were burying me alive. Now listen to me. I clawed at that box. I know I'm going over the time, but it's hard to tell a story of my life in, in, in that short of a time because this is a before Christ and after Christ. I was so afraid that I, I bit the box at my teeth. I had wood in my gums. I found out later that I had spent a week inside that box. And all I can tell you is when I was in that box, something snapped. I can't tell you what it was. My son is a licensed family counselor. He would probably be better qualified. But something snapped when I was in that box. And when that thing snapped, I no longer could feel anything. I could not feel pain. I could not feel happiness. The only thing I was capable of feeling was lust, anger, hate. But I couldn't feel any human emotions. I believe when I was in that box that I became demon possessed while in that box. And when I got out of reform school, I said to myself, I ain't never ever gonna be put in a box again. They're gonna have to kill me to put me in a box and they're gonna have to carry me out of this place in the box. And I'm not a bad man, but I just grew up in a bad neighborhood. North Avenue, Walbansi in Chicago, it's still a bad neighborhood. And so I got out of reform school 
And the part of my release from early release from reform school is I had to join the city boxing team. I can't cover 25 years of my life in an hour. It's not possible, but I'm going to do my best. I can't cover the 40 years since I've been saved in an hour, but I'm going to do my best because you're worth the best. Your loved one's worth the best. We serve a God that can break off all chains. We serve a God that can give you a new life. People wonder why I worship like I do. I went through 12 years of my life where I couldn't feel nothing. I come to church, and all of a sudden, I got the Holy Ghost all over me. I got joy. I got peace. I'm going to dance. I'm going to dance because I went through years where I could feel nothing. Now, please bear with me because I'm going to tell you this. So I, 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 I'm now the warlord of the, of the vice lords of the lords. And in, in 1973, in 1973 and 74, was a particularly brutally hot summer in Chicago. And I don't know, anybody here ever grow up in, in Chicago or New York or a place like that? And when things get really hot, everybody sits on their doorsteps because you burn up in your apartment. And very few people had air conditioners. So, so things were getting really tense already because of the heat and the humidity and the stuff like that. So, so there was a lot of conflict, a lot of, there was a lot of things happening between the Latin Kings and the Lords. So I got together with the Lord Lord of the Latin Kings and we set up a rumble called the Humble Park Riots. How many have ever heard of the Humble Park Riots? So we set up a rumble at the Humble Park in Humble Park. It was supposed to be 600 Latin Kings and 600 lords. And we had agreed on these knives, bats, bottles, chains. Those were the, the weapons that were allowed, but there would be no guns. We set up the rumble at Humble Park. Now, when we showed up at Humble Park, not only did the Latin Kings show up, but the Black Panthers wanted a piece of the action too. Because whoever won this rumble took control of the northwest side of Chicago. And the dragon showed up in Chinatown. And the always showed up. Instead of two gains having out, and we had over 6,000 members, but we only decided on 600 from each gain. Now you got six or seven gains with 600. We went to fighting, and Mayor Daly, Richard Daly, who was the mayor for a long time, what he did is the, they got so bad, the rumble, that three Chicago police officers got killed the first day of the rumble. And he withdrew all the police and he called in the National Guard. And he gave orders to surround Elmo Park. Don't let anybody in and don't let anybody out. It was a different time. It was a different place. And for three days, all these major gains, Mayor Daly had it figured in his head that if they just mess each other up really bad, I'm not going to have to deal with them anymore. And so during this whole thing, three Chicago police officers die. And on the third day of the Humble Park riots, now I, 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 I want you to imagine what we've seen on TV with some of the riots that have happened recently. But imagine all those buildings burning and all these people multiplied many times over attacking one another. And imagine that going on, on and off for three days. When I set up the rumble in Humble Park with the Latin Kings and these, all these other gangs showed up, nobody anticipated that. My baby brother Donald, who was 15 years old, he had begged me, he had begged me to always let him fight in a rumble. But I kept my baby brother out of it. You see, sin will kill you and sin will kill the people you love. And I kept my baby brother out of the rumbles, but he kept begging me and kept begging me, said, you got Johnny, you got to let me fight. Johnny, you got to let me fight. They're disrespecting me. So I thought to myself, there's only 600 of us, only 600 of them. I'll keep him real close to me. It's a good time to get his feet wet, but oh, I had it all wrong. So my baby brother Donald is in this game, in this, in this, this, this horrible rumble that takes place at Humble Park. And we've been fighting now for three days. The northwest side of Chicago's on fire. There's burning cars, burning rubber, burning houses. There's smoke everywhere. There's people screaming. There's, pe there's noise. 
there's so much noise, you, 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 you can't hear yourself think. You, you can't hear the person next to you. But in the midst of this, on the third night, I heard my brother's voice scream. You mamas, you know what I'm talking about. You could take your child and put that child in a room of a thousand children, turn your back and shut your eyes, and if your child cries out, you'll know exactly which one it is and exactly where they're at. And with all this going on, I heard my brother screaming, Johnny, they're cutting me. They're cutting me. You see, being an evangelist is not my job. Preaching the gospel is not my job. It's my life. It's my life. It's my life. And, and so, on the third day, I hear him screaming, they're cutting me, they're cutting me. And so, I'm trying to find my brother in all this chaos. And I can hear him screaming, I know I'm getting closer, because I can hear his scream getting louder. And I got so careless, they got, cut my arm open, they cut my face. By the time I was 25 years old, I'd been stabbed three times and shot once. There's nothing glorious or nothing to admire about being in a game, being involved with the Gambino family. There's nothing glorious about that lifestyle. But I got to my baby brother, in the alley, a filthy, dirty alley. I'm a game banger that can't read. I'm a game banger that all I've known my whole life is games. And I'm thinking to myself, there's got to be something better than this. There's got to be something better than this. There has to be something better than this. So finally, I find my brother in this alley next to a dumpster. They had cut him open several times, and part of his insides were hanging out, his intestines. They cut some of his intestines, and you could smell the bile. Some of you know that are first responders. So I took my shirt off and I wrapped it around my brother. I put him back in the best I could and wrapped my shirt around him. And then he reached out to grab my face and all the fingers on his right hand were gone. Because in those days, if you killed a prominent member from another gang, what they would often do, because I was the warlord, they would cut the finger off and wear it around their neck as a trophy. So they cut my brother's fingers off when he was alive, 15 years old. I got to my baby brother. And Marco, listen to this. This is why what you were doing at the Way World Outreach is so important. Because I got to my baby brother, and I'm holding him in my arms, and he's saying, don't let me die. I don't want to die. And I lied to him, Robert. I said, you're not going to die. But I knew he was going to die because his face had already turned chalky gray. He was sweating horribly, but his skin was as cold as ice. His eyes rolled back in his head. And I watched my baby brother die in a filthy alley on the north side of Chicago. You see, that's why I go to these prisons overseas. That's why I'm so thankful God called me to evangelize, to share the good news with as many that I can hear, because the world needs to hear it. Please hear me. So my baby brother dies in that alley. So I went into hiding, a prostitute. You know, we tend to look down our noses at prostitutes, but a lot of them are in that lifestyle because they're being raped by family members and stuff, and, and they just tell you, if I'm going to be raped, I might as well be paid for it. I'm not being vulgar. It's the way it was. But a prostitute, 
took me into her home, sewed me up so I could get to a hospital, took care of me, knowing that if they found me in her home, what they would have done to her would not have been even human. So she may have been a prostitute, but she had a good heart. And, and you hear what I'm saying? Now, now, I'm here, and she's taking care of me the best she can. It's not a hospital, but they're doing the best they can. And someone comes busting through the door, man. I, I grab my piece, and I look up, and I know who it is, so I, 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 I think it's all right. And he comes and he runs up to me. He says, Johnny, you got to come with me. You got to come with me, Johnny. I said, What's wrong? He said, Francis, you got to come with me, Johnny Francis. And so I, 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 I've been cut, I've been shot. And I go, and I go back to North Avenue and Ashland where it comes together, the very alley where my brother died three days before. And I get there. There's a lot I could tell you, but I can't cover it all tonight. And I find my mama. She's sitting on the street, broad daylight, cars going by, people walking around her like it was a bag of garbage. And she's got my sister Frances in her lap, what's left of her. And she'd been shot three times in the back of the head with a 357 mag to draw me out. Thomas, it's why I'm grateful for what you do. It's why I'm grateful. When they shot my sister, they sh everything in the face from her nose up was gone. Blew her whole forehead off, blew her eye sockets out. And so I get to my sister, my mama, and my mama's got my sister in her lap. And as only a mama could do, she's kissing my sister. And she's saying, Francis, you're okay, Francis. You're okay, Francis. You're okay, Francis. But you see, Francis don't have a face. Francis' head is gone. And I walked up to my mama, and I said to my mama, I said, Mom, Francis is not okay, Mama. Mama, Francis is dead, Mama. She's not okay, Mama. My, my mama's face is covered with blood because she's kissing what was left of my sister's face. And then I guess the shock wore off. My mom looked at me. And she said, I wish you had never been born. And at that moment, I wished I had never been born. Because the sin in my life caused my brother to be dead at 15, my sister to be murdered at 17. And, and Pastor, I often thought to myself, was she afraid? Did she know? Did she know they were about to kill her? What, what, what was she thinking? What was going on in her mind? You see, saints of God, sin kills. The wages of sin is death. Satan does come to kill, steal, and destroy. But aren't you glad that you've been set free of the devil? Aren't you grateful? So from there, I went to work in organized crime. My two uncles worked for Mr. Giacana, who worked for Mr. Gambino, who worked uh, for Mr. D'Angelo. And I can talk a lot more freely about this today because that was 40 years ago, and all three of those men are dead. Uh, two were shot to death. The other one died uh, with a Roman uh, Cuban necktie. So I can talk more freely about it today. But I ended up involved in organized crime. I had worked directly for Mr. Giacana when he would come to town. By the time I got saved, he was dead. I worked for the Mr. D'Angelo. 
who ran Chicago from Mr. Diaconor, and Mr. Gambino, who ran Chicago and New York from there and part of the garment district. And I went up my way and organized crime. And I'm 25 years old now. I had done time in Statesville State Federal Penitentiary, Joliet State Penitentiary, when the, John Gacy was there, Richard Speck was there. Some of the worst inmates in the world were inside that prison at the time. I worked my way up into the Gambino family. I had money, I had cars, I hated life. And I remember going to church one day, this is so, my brother Ray used to work in the business with me and our job was to break arms and legs for a living, cut fingers off, cut noses off, ears off, if someone put their nose where it didn't belong, their nose would get cut off, if they had their finger in the tills, you know, if they were a pimp and they got their fingers in the till, they get a finger cut off. I'm not proud of this, I'm ashamed of it. But he would go to church, he had gone to Vietnam and his wife had promised God that if God would bring him home from Vietnam that she would serve him. So she kept her word to God. And occasionally my brother would go to church with her to, to compete, to, even though he was involved in organized crime, he was still a married man. And he wanted to keep his wife happy. So he would go with her once in a while. And I guess God must have got a hold of him because he started begging me to go to church with him. Now, I didn't go to church, and he didn't really, because he'd, Monday he'd be out doing the same thing that he was doing with me the week before, but he acted guilty about it. it wasn't, he didn't enjoy it like he used to. Let me explain this. So my brother's calling me all the time about going to church with him just one time to get his wife off his back, come one time, and so this is a true story, it's how it went down. And so I don't know nothing about church. The only time I'd ever been in the spiritual thing was Woodstock, so I figure that's got to be, you know, the dress code, you know. I'm serious, man. You, you, we laugh, but I'd never been in a church building. I didn't go to weddings. I went to the receptions. I'd never been in a church building, so I didn't know how to dress. So I tell my brother, I says, my, my brother, I'm like, I got hair down here. And I had to do a job that night, so what I would do is I would grease my hair because if the person you were working on tried to grab you by the hair, your greased hair would cause you to, their fingers to slide through your hair. Now I don't have to worry about that. But um, my, they invited me to church, and finally I said, look, man, I'm not dressed for church. And my brother says, come as you are. And you know what? I believe that. I believe we ought to come as we are, but we ought to leave changed. We ought to come as we are, but we ought to leave changed. Come as you are, but no, I'm, 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 I've got a lot of ground to cover here, and I've had, I'm just kind of just going over the surface a little bit, but I just want you to know that God is a merciful God. He's a gracious God. God is a loving God. God loves you. God loves you. God loves everybody out there listening right now. God loves you. Now, please listen to me. I'm, I'm hurrying really fast now. And, and, um, and so finally, finally, he just called me up, and he said, you got to come, you got to come, you got to come. And I said, okay, I'll come. So I don't know what to do. My hair's greased back. It's past my shoulders. I don't got no shirt on. And so I drank two glasses of scotch, eight ounces, before I left the house. I got into the parking lot of the church and smoked three joints. I'm not proud of that. <laughs> I, that's obviously something I should say. <laughs> but I thought, I thought to myself, I don't know nothing about this church stuff, but I can handle anything now. So I walk in this building, bear with me, I'm almost done. I walk in this building, these people are, are worshiping, and a guy meets me at the back door, Brother Cox, and what wisdom God gave Brother Cox, because he could have said, hey, what are you doing in here, man, with no shirt on? Don't you got no respect? He takes off his sports coat. He says, man, the air conditioner's on pretty high in there. Why don't you wear my sports coat so you don't get cold? So, so Brother Cox gives me his coat, now, I don't want no one in church to know that I don't belong there. 
I want to think I go to church all the time. So I walk down to the front row. And I say, it was like the partner of the Red Sea, man. They was, <laughs> because most of the people who got saved, I used to do business with to go to this church. So I sit down in the front row. And I, I've got to tell you the truth. I don't remember what the preacher preached. All I know is the moment I sat down, I felt these fists inside my stomach. I'm an ex-boxer. I've been beat up by the best. And there's something inside of me that's beating my guts out from the inside. I can feel these punches inside me. I know now it was demons. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting there. I don't know what the guy preached, but then he runs up to me, throws his hand on my head, tells all me the stuff I'm going to do, which I don't understand any what he's telling me I'm going to do. You're going to preach the gospel. You're going to go all over the world. You're going to be an evangelist. And, and, and I'm saying, okay. But, and... and <laughs> no way you got to hear this and God chose the perfect guy this guy was on a good day about five foot tall maybe 110 pounds and so he, he jumps over a chair and grabs me by the head and I'm thinking I'm, I'm just going to lay this dude out and I thought of course God would not let me do that but I thought I thought no, I can't lay this guy out because I, I'm going to be embarrassed I hit this guy, you know. So he, he talks all this stuff to me, and while he's doing it, my, my, I'm getting beat to death on the inside. So I go home, I walk into the crib, and, and, um, <laughs> and uh, I hammer down some drinks, but the fists don't go away. I had not felt guilt or shame in 12 years. And now I feel ashamed of everything I've ever done. I remember every time I cussed. I remember every crime I committed. I remember everything I did when I was so high that I don't even remember being where I was. And I remembered it. So I go over to my wife and I says to her, I said, let's smoke a joint. She... She went to the altar and got right with God. I didn't. She said, I don't smoke dope anymore. Now, I said, well, I don't care. Let's get drunk. She said, I don't drink no more. So I got to hear some music at this point because I can't get, I can't get this out of my head. So I put on a record, and the record so happened to be the Rolling Stones. You, you can't make this up. And the song is Sympathy for the Devil. But God ain't got no sympathy for the devil. He, she knocks the stereo off the platform because she said, I don't listen to that no more. So I walk over, and I never hit her. And I'm going to tattoo her because she knocked my record player on the floor. And, and when I went towards her, I began to shake violently. So she went to bed that night. I went on a three-day drunk. I went on a three-day drunk. I went on a binge for three days. I come home. You can imagine what I might have been up to. You can imagine what my wife would have thought. I walk in. I'm laying on the couch after a three-day binge. And I said, what do, you guys, what do you think now? She said, Jesus loves you. <laughs> Jesus loves you. I don't even, Jesus loves me. I'm asking you what you think right now. So now I'm scared of my wife. <laughs> I got a ghost into my house. I got these fists inside my stomach. I'm sorry about the time, but I'm hurrying really fast. So I start to go, th I'm sorry about the time, but I'm trying to go fast. But this, so all I can think of is I got a, I got a shooter. So I had a guy that worked for me by the name of Tito. And Tito, I called Tito up. I said, Tito, I'm going to shoot my wife. I want you to show up 10 minutes from this time because I'm going to shoot her, then I'm going to shoot myself twice. Then I want you to take the gun, and it's going to look like just the thing, you know, a drug, drug body that went bad. My wife's dead. I got shot twice. So I was willing to shoot myself twice 
to murder my wife. I got to the door and I ran into a wall where there was an open doorway. And every time I tried to go through that wall, I would begin to shake violently. I begin to shake violently and those fists would go crazy inside of me. Are you listening to what I'm saying? So bear with me. So, 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 so after a three-day drunk and doing all these terrible things, I come sitting on the couch. I don't know what to do. And a phone number comes to my head, 2 o'clock in the morning, three days from Mother's Day. A phone number comes to my head. I know it's taking, please forgive me, but this takes a little time to cover this. But a phone number. Now, this is before a caller ID, mind you. So a phone number comes into my head. 40 years ago, I don't think anybody had caller ID unless you were really rich. And um, a phone number comes to my head. I don't know the number for nothing. But I dialed the number, 2 o'clock in the morning. I, I called out three Chicago police officers, pulled a gun, and pointed it at them. And they turned around and walked away. You don't do that in Chicago. I wanted to die, but I wanted to die by police suicide. Now listen to me. So I'm sitting there. I got these fists in my stomach. There's ghosts in my house. I'm scared of my I'm guilty for all this stuff. So a number comes to my head, and I dial the number like this, not like this. <laughs> I dial the number. 2 o'clock in the morning. A man answers on the other end. He says, hello, John. I said, I don't know how I knew, but I knew that was the preacher that was preaching that laid his hand on me. You ain't listening. Do I believe in miracles? Do I believe in miracles? I serve a God of miracles. You serve your salvation of your house. Now, I'm going to bring it in for a landing. There's so much more to tell you, but I'm just going to bring it in right now for landing. He says, hello, John, on the phone. I said, I don't know what you did. I don't know if you put microdot on me and I've been high for three days. I said, but you started this and you're going to fix it. Now, you know if I had tried to hurt that preacher, God would have seriously hurt me. But the man says to me, he says, pray. I said to myself, I ain't never prayed. He said, pray, and it'll get better. I thought, what I got to lose? This is the prayer I prayed. He says to me, he says, John, just ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins and to come into your life right now. Listen to this. So I asked Jesus to come into my life right then to forgive me of my sins. And I didn't feel this overwhelming thing. I remember crying, but immediately I started flushing all my dope down the toilet. I physically, I had a great big bar in my living room. I threw the whole bar out in the front yard. You would have thought it was Mardi Gras. My neighbors were out there grabbing <laughs> bottles. And I, had, I won my first convert the next day. I had 18 bales of pot delivered to my crib the day before I got saved. Eight, you know how long it takes to flush 18 bales of pot down the toilet? My brother Dan calls me the next day, God rest his soul. And he said, hey, John, he used to sell dope for me. He said, John, you still got that Vietnamese? I said, no, man, it's all gone. I flushed it down the toilet. He said, well, you got any lewds I can sell? I said, no. I usually had a five-gallon pickle jar of lewds. They were all gone. He said, you got any black beauties? I said, no, they're all gone. He said, you got any crack? Said, no, it's all gone. You got any, got any coke? No, it's all gone. You got any heroin? No, it's all gone. I flushed th thousands of dollars of dope. I flushed down the toilet. But here's what my brother says to me. My brother Dan says to me, he said, what happened? You get busted? And I said, sort of. <laughs> He said, what do you mean? I said, I don't know. I said, and I don't mean it's disrespectful. I said, I, have you ever heard of this guy, Jesus? He said, I'd never heard Jesus other than in cuss words. He said, I said, well, I think, I think, Dan, I think I got religion. I'm serious. 
and Danny says to me, he says, you got religion? I said, yeah, I think I got religion. He said, well, you ain't never steered me wrong before. If you got religion, I want religion. Wait, wait, you're going to shout now. You're going to shout now. And he says, I said, I said, he said, how do you get religion? Well, no one told me how to get it. And so I says to him, I said, Danny, all I remember was asking this guy, Jesus, I don't mean it's disrespectful, I didn't know no better. I said, all I remember was asking this guy, Jesus, to forgive my sins and kind of my heart as my Lord and my Savior, that he died on the cross of Calvary, that the cross is just not something you wear on a chain around your neck. And I said, Danny, I asked him to come in my life and all of I know, the next thing I know, I'm flushing all my drugs down the toilet. And I, and And I led my brother to the Lord on the phone. But I'm going to close. But I, I'm going to, I'm going to close. I'm going to close right now. I promise. I'm telling a life story. It's kind of hard to do. And and, and so, the two days later, remember I broke my mama's heart. I got two of her children killed in three days. I robbed my mama of her son. I robbed my mom of her happiness. And she called me on the phone. You know how it is in the neighborhood. She says, the women at the laundromat have been talking to me. And they said, you're giving away money and you're giving people back stuff you took from them. And they said that you're walking around and, and I'm not gonna use the language she used with this silly smile on your face. I said, yeah, Ma, I did that. I'm doing that. She said, Ma, son, what's the matter with you? I said, I don't know, Ma. I said, Ma, can you help me with something? I got to know. I said, Mama, what is it that you feel inside that you feel like you're going up a roller coaster and then down real quick and then up and then down real quick? And my mom got real quiet on the other end. I said, Mama, I feel that all the time now. Mom, what is that? And my mama says, Son, I think that's love. And I said, Mama, see, now I'm really educated in religion. <laughs> and I said, Mama, I said, I met someone by the name of Jesus. And that's what's inside of me now. That's what I feel now. That's what I feel now. That's what I feel now. I'm full of love. I'm full of joy. I'm full of peace. And I'm going to close. So I, get, I tell my mom and my mama, I led my mother to the Lord. And the last 16 years of her life, I was the best son that I could be to my mama, and God healed our relationship. Now listen to me. Listen to me. This is where the rubber meets the road. If God could take a man like that and save me 40 years ago and call me to preach and let me preach the gospel over 10,000 times in 38 states and 15 foreign countries. God can do the same thing for you. There's nobody God can't save. There's no life that God can't change. There's nobody that God can't turn around.